Ah, yes. <laughs> it's been on a long time. Yes. Yeah. And um, his main man, his main man of ops, Dino, he hooked me up. There you go. Like, hello. So, should we try to do the whole interview with this on? That'd be amazing. That would be really <laughs> My head would fall off. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'd be like fall asleep. I don't know. I don't know how I used to run around with this thing. I'm like thinking about the sprints and how it just it would feel so light. Now it feels so heavy. What happened? What happened to us? Yeah, exactly. That's a problem. I can't drink my coffee. Yeah, that's right. You gotta that's why I'm anti-iced coffee today. Like, this is <sighs> I'm so pumped up about this. Okay. All that's right. First thing that comes to your mind. Okay. <laughs> you ready? Yeah, let's do it. Pizza. Pizza. I can't answer it with another <laughs> Wait, oh, I thought you were doing a mic test. What are we doing? I'm going to say a word, and yeah. then you say the first thing that comes to your mind. Oh, okay. Are we recording, by the way? We're recording. We're sweet. Cool. Pizza. Starving. <laughs> Grit. Uh, Angela Duckworth. COVID. Nightmare. George Floyd. BLM. Mentor. Oh, man. Oh, man. There's so many. It's hard. Oh, man. Um, Bill Magner. You'll have to tell me who that is. Uh, do you want me to tell you now or tell you later? Mm. Who's Bill? Yeah. Bill was... Uh, Sorry, I'm getting the audio is a little funky. So Bill was uh, the guy who gave me my first job. Um, and uh, he didn't need to. I was like pretty unimpressive coming out of Dartmouth, at least I, uh, at least looking back at myself now. Um, and he took a bet on me. And it was, uh, I'll, I'll never forget it. And, he, and the thing that even more so than just giving me that first opportunity was he uh, would take me to breakfast at the U Club in Washington, D.C., once a quarter. I mean, this, this guy was, you know, CEO of Spalding and Sly, which was acquired by Jones Lang LaSalle. Um, and I was like a lowly analyst and had no business going to lunch with him or breakfast, but it was always a breakfast meeting. Um, and he would just take me to breakfast and we would talk. And for, it, I just would try to gleam as much as I could from him. And I don't really know that I added any value to that conversation. And I look back at my time now, I look back at that and I'm like, why was he spending so much time with me? But I try to pull from that, not from what he told me during those, but like how generous he was with his time uh, to someone who wasn't providing much value to the firm. Uh, I can't imagine that's providing any value to his life. And he was just so generous with his time because I think he knew how much it meant to me. And so I think about that now. Um, when I have uh, someone who's early in their career and my, you know, potentially um, I feel like maybe it's not the best use of my time to, to, to be spending that sort of uh, those extra moments with them. And I think back what Bill did and how, how much that motivated me, how much more loyal I was to the firm because of that, how much harder I worked, how many more hours I put in. And, um, you know, I just look back at that and I think about that a lot and sort of how I apply my own time with sort of the next generation of, of people I work with. I love it. Very well said. Very well said. Um, thanks for being on. It's great to have you. I yeah. guess conversation I've wanted to have for a long time and look forward to iterating and just learning as much as possible and, and just love what you and your brother have done with the PLL. It's, uh, it's fantastic in a lot of ways, just looking at things from a little bit different perspective. And my journey, of course, performance sport, entrepreneur at the same time as coaching. I'm 20 years now into coaching. Um, GM of USA Rugby left to start the Free Jacks and kind of Major League Rugby. Uh, and this podcast is really to serve to learn and sit down with, you know, with um, peers and see what's working for them and what's not working and uh, just how we all can continue to improve and using sports to, to make the world a better place. So really, really appreciate you taking the time. You guys got a major, major event coming up, which is awesome. Yeah. Be live and uh, taking the time just to, to, to share thoughts. So it's, it's really cool and really appreciate it. Appreciate um, you having me. You know, one of the things that I, I, I love that, it, that you guys talk about are kind of your six core values and how you guys operate and, what, and that really drives your behaviors. You know, the, the stay grounded, think critically, encourage creativity, 
you know, persevere through the noise, operate like an owner. And I think you have another one, be helpful or something. Yep. I, I, you got them all. Yeah. Dive into it. Dive into what, what was that? How'd you guys come up with those for you guys? Why does that work for you? Does it work for you? Yeah, like, I, th I, th I think like, um, so it was one of the first things we did and Paul and I iterated a ton on them. Um, but it was one of the first things I really tried to push as we, you know, we were like, okay, we're going to do this. We're going to build a new league. The former league wants nothing to do with us. They told us to pound sand are not taking us seriously. That was like just enough motivation on top of all the other motivation to sort of set the path of, of doing a new league. And uh, when you build a new business, you really need to build a good foundation. And it starts with the people you bring on, oftentimes the founders, but then that executive team you start to look to hire um, and then round out the skill sets that, that, that you don't have as a founder and being able to understand that. And then, and then I think the most, the other most important piece right at the beginning is what is your mission? What's your mission statement? You know, ours is to trailblaze the future of professional sports. It's player led and fan focused. Um, and then to set values. And, and, and we talk about our values more than, than, I initially ever thought we would, but I, I came from a culture of being a value-driven business in Silicon Valley, a company called Funding Circle, um, before that, Endurance Lending Network, and we were always very values-driven, and I thought that set a good foundation for how to operate uh, as an employee, uh, as an owner of the business, um, as a steward of, of invested capital, as a representative of, of your community, because um, it all sort of is intertwined. And uh, for us, I wanted to think about when setting those values, you know, how it, uh, how it, how we conducted ourselves internally at the company, externally facing, because it's an externally facing business. And then also all the different factors that would be applied being in a high profile business. I, I personally don't love that it's so high profile. Um, I like sort of the, 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 the less pro high profile businesses, the non-sexy businesses. Um, but I just seem to find myself in these places where it's like all of a sudden a high profile business and sports is nothing's more high profile than that. And I'm not going to sit here and try to act like a man NFL or an NBA or anything like that, but people do pay attention. People do tweet at you. People do tweet at us. There is hate. That's what makes sports special is that everyone is entitled to their opinion, um, whether they're right or wrong, whether it's factually based or not. Um, and so I knew that I applied sort of, you know, how we wanted to operate as, as stakeholders in the business. Um, and then also what type of company we were building. I knew that we needed to have um, intrinsic values that we that sort of set our core every single day. Um, and I knew that it was going to be hard. It still is really hard. And we just constantly go back to those values. Um, you know, I'll have an intern who's with us for a couple months and they end up leaving. They'll send me a text and they'll be like, hope you're persevering to the noise and this is hard, right? And so they're pulling our values. And that for me reflects that we're doing a good job talking about, we have a values wall where all of our values are on the wall here in our office. And I think something that allows us to push through um, and, and hopefully is building a great foundation for our company. I love, and you know, every sports team you've been on and every company, everybody writes their values down. But the hard part is, trying to live and, and get towards those every day. And that's the really, really hard part. What, what is an every day for you right now? Like what, is, what is life like? So uh, you're imagining you know, sports entertainment, league and business. What does it look like? It's, it's hard. I, I think, um, you know, look, I'm not gonna sit here and complain. I'm very fortunate to have, um, you know, we're great to have, we're fortunate to have good investors or we're fortunate to have a great team around me that, that takes a lot of the heavy lifting off my plate. Um, I think the, I think if you told me that we would be um, entering in our second year of, of sort of being, having the lights on, you know, we've been in production of the PLL for, you know, for almost four years now, but, you know, going into our second season, if you were to tell me that you were going to, we were going to have to do it during a pandemic, I probably would have taken my foot off the gas four years ago and been like, ah, maybe it's not great. What is that? Uh, and so there's just embedded stress and things you can't control. I was talking to my COO about this yesterday is like, you know, setting artificial deadlines earlier than when, than the, when the true deadlines actually are to leave us space for all the extra planning. Because essentially when you're planning something that's so new, like a quarantine season, um, uh, you know, we have a, a quarantine season, which, we're, which we've dubbed as our championship series that starts on July 25th on NBC. But when you do that, you don't have fans and you need all the players to quarantine, you need all the staff to quarantine, you need all the production staff to quarantine. And then there's all these tests that need to be done. There's tests that need to be mailed. There's, um, 
so many different operational levers that need to be pulled that are so different than last year when we started this tour based league uh, that it, it can be overwhelming. And so I think that the, the stress level of, of sort of that there's building basically a league from scratch again uh, was, was definitely hard. I think that, um, you know, I could have benefited from probably being more mindful around uh, my own self-discipline. I think that, you know, when you have to go through something like a, just a pandemic at the company level, you know, we were sort of shooting out of the gates in February. We announced big news title partners. You know, we brought ticket sales in house. Tickets were flying like they weren't last year. You know, the brand seemed to be taken off. We were getting meetings with with uh, advertisers that we never got at meetings with. NBC was more willing to give us more television inventory than they were before. And um, and then all of a sudden, the emergency brakes pulled. It, it was it was hard. It was like what I just there was a couple of weeks where I just couldn't believe that this was happening, just just in full candor. And so then you had to reset and be like, you know, the only way to get through this is just to operate one day at a time and so you know it's an old adage is the only way to eat an elephant is one bite at a time and so we just really took that approach every single day okay what's the new update today you know what's what's being said and talk to every smart person you possibly can um, but the reality is is no one really had better information that was readily available in the public um, and so you know obviously there's skews on on the information right there's skews on you know uh, cases versus deaths depending on which periodical you're reading and um, but at the time, this was so new that the information that was coming out on a daily basis was the best information. And the only case study we had was, you know, 1918 Spanish flu pandemic. So there wasn't good comps to pull from to look at this and say, hey, this is what we do. There was no operational plan. So I think that was, was pretty difficult. Um, so you know, the picture of uh, Mike eating an elephant, is that possible? Yeah. <laughs> Uh, I was I was I was eating a lot of unhealthy things. I've actually been uh, I've actually been vegan for the last four weeks just to try to like clean my system out because I was so unhealthy for the last I three months. Somebody who um, has gone vegan, he's like, Mags, you got to do it because you're just you're you're gonna have stupendous poops. You're gonna love it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's uh, yeah. My brother, my mobile Paul's been vegan because his back. He went vegan because of his back. Um, and my, I went, uh, I'm not like, I don't know how long I'll stay, but I just been, I just been trying it, um, just to see if I could bring less inflammation to my entire body. I just felt inflamed everywhere, um, because of, because of COVID and, and just the, just, just the reality of, of dealing with all this. Um, and so I, I was like, let me see if I can bring something that's going to provide less inflammation. And I've been trying to implement a yoga practice, uh, into my daily routine. Um, so Hopefully that that that's going to allow me to to temper through this. But you know, net net, I'm, I'm painting a really bad picture. I think, like I said, we have great group of investors who are incredibly supportive and allow us a lot of rain to be creative. Um, we were the first professional sports league to announce a return back, and, and yeah. we went live on NBC's Today Show with Paul. Um, and you know, we were pushing the envelope with our board and with our players who were bought in at the beginning and our colleagues to say it looks like this is going to be the only feasible way to have a season. We need to have a season. Um, and, you know, is, is everyone bought into doing this? And you know, I've just been impressed about how, how hard our teams worked, especially when you know, we have a large portion of our team that's in New York. We used to have a New York office. We kind of, uh, everyone's remote now. So, um, you know, I see that my colleagues there working in their apartments, um, really taking quarantine seriously because they're in New York. Um, and, and the amount of work and, and sort of how they're able to produce uh, sort of a, a new form of operations and standards and protocol out of their tiny apartments in New York City is just really impressive. And I'm just grateful to be able to have colleagues like that. It's like, like the efficiency has changed so much. Like we, we got, you know, we were looking, we were about to have our first home game, first inaugural home game ever. We had basically sold out at St. Patty's weekend in Boston. So fun. Yeah. All the costs are in the door you know a lot of the revenue is still to come in so we're kind of in that space where you gotta you know you've, you've, you've done it all you're ready to go you're about to pull the trigger you know and then we have to make a, the wise decision to suspend and cancel the season pretty quickly across the board for our league what do we do with our players honor their contracts make sure they're whole let's go let's build up to 2021 let's even let's double down on our on our league staff let's make sure we're we're, we're building this right heading into 21 but at the local level, it's you're scrambling like you know we gotta we gotta figure out a way to, to make means and you're working with your board and and um, 
trying to tie up the loose ends that, you know, there's just a gap. There's a gap in a PL, and yeah. uh, you, know, you got to really rely on, on really good investors, which we also have in our ownership group who are fantastic. And like, let's get through this. And, and we, we owe this to our community and let's go. And of our season ticket holders, only two asked for a refund, which is, which is brilliant. So we're really excited about right, that, that next iteration. That rare do you get though when you're in the middle of something? It'd be like in the middle of a game of football or lacrosse or anything else or rugby and be like, wait, 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 stop, blow the whistle. We're going to do this later, come back and we're going to start the game over. And we never get that, right? So in some ways, for, for me, this has been a silver line to be like, okay, who are we again? Like, what did we set out to do? Are, are we really on that track? Or are we, are we moving this in the direction that we, that we hope to? Um, and how can we make sure we're continuing to do that and, and do that the best possible way? And that's just an opportunity we never get, right? Mm -hmm. Why do you think you had these seasoned fan holders that were so loyal and they only had two ask for a rebate? Like, what, what, what about your team um, made, made those – and what you were able to put out there made them so, feel so um, loyal to you? Right. I think what we've, what we've tried to do a good job of is say this is your team because it is. You know, even in, we built our, you know, our, our kind of mantras, humble, hardworking, have fun. But the humble is like community first number one, our team second, and ourself third. It's not that we're not taking care of ourselves and, and we're, as individuals, we're not really important and we're doing, doing work, but okay. And then it's the team. Let's make sure the team's uh, iterating, but this is not about the team. This is about at the end of the day, providing an opportunity for people to come together, celebrate life, get away from the craziness of the world, watch a good, good sport happen, be with their friends, meet new friends. You're wearing a different jersey than I'm wearing. We're having a beer together. It's just, a, it's a great environment. And I think our fans are, are, are really excited about that. And that's what they, they want to feel and want to be a part of what they're driving. And so in many cases, it's theirs, right? And, you know, we have a busy reveal. It's packed. They're, they're having fun. Uh, people from, from all walks of life, which, which is fantastic. So for us, it's very much that it's a share, shared, shared, concept of we love we love life let's work really hard but let's celebrate that and i think that's that's the feeling hopefully that that they have and that continues obviously the day that we were doing this like the first people i told were our season ticket holders and this is what's happening come come with me come come with with the rest of us and let's go towards 2021 are, are, are you in and i need your help um and sometimes that goes a long way and they've been brilliant that's awesome yeah. yeah, it's great. It's so uh, it's like two. It's like two parts. Like one, you you know your vulnerability and communication, and then also like the culture you set with the Free Jacks, and then also the culture of of rugby in general, right? Which is like pretty unique and special. Right, it's that duality, right? Let's take it really serious, but in the, the day, let's shake hands. And sport is just sport, which is which is brilliant. On the communication side, and that's something I think you guys do brilliant at from day one, is is, is working and talking with your community and engaging with your community. Mm -hmm. I think just really high quality engagement because you're not only talking you're not talking at your community you're talking with them mm -hmm. and why this is the decision we're making I, I just thought that I, i've always thought that was brilliant how you guys have done that and and, and paul seems to really to get that message right as well so it's it's great to see yeah yeah totally he, he does a great job and paul leads uh, our marketing media team which is which is sort of renowned now right and and um you know, a lot of it's been the culture of, of just sort of how we wanted to, how we know we have to uh, differentiate ourselves. You know, there's uh, everyone talks about the shield at the NFL and they call it the shield or the logo at the NBA. Um, and I always thought that that just set up like this sort of firewall, the separation from league teams, fans. Um, and for us, I mean, I've even had crazy, crazy ideas like, you know, let's, let's put a camera and do like reality TV of like what it's like to work in the PLL office. Now there's a lot of stuff that we would need to figure out around sort of like game planning and strategy and like, you know, when to close meetings and not close meetings. But at the end of the day, we want our fans to feel like they're a part of it. And, and also we, we welcome their thoughts and feedback and try not to be defensive about it. I would watch that and I have no time in the day. I'd be fired up to see it. That'd be great. Right. right. Yeah. We've actually talked about that uh, as a way to like differentiate ourselves and like kind of like Justin TV model and how they started. Love it. Taking a step back, right? You serial entrepreneur now, obviously you, you captain of Dartmouth then went into real estate and then you started kind of building a gym and then that went into more gyms and then you kind of, you know, you were working with Tonelli for a bit and you guys built a kind of an investment portfolio and, took a lot of risks I think how did how did you get into that how did you, you know like what's the what was that transition like and how do you stay with it 
Yeah, I th- oh, man, it's, it's a good question. Sometimes I, I, I feel like I'm not risk adverse at all. Um, and I've done some, um, some work in therapy when I, when I used to be up there. I need to get back in therapy. But when I was in therapy, I did some work on this stuff um, and, and just sort of try to analyze my own risk appetite. Um, I think a lot of it started from, you know, we've all, I think you know, probably, probably is genetics, like uh, you know, where I'm half Lebanese and the Lebanese are known for being like very scrappy and entrepreneurial and, you know, coming from Lebanon, especially in the, in the, in the wave of early 1900s and having to be like merchants. And so, you know, my dad was a paper salesman. He works at the PLL now, but you know, when you're a paper salesman and you're working on zero salary and all commission, that's essentially, you know, you're an entrepreneur. Um, and we were always doing things like setting up lemonade stands or shoveling snow. Um, I always had a job in high school. I worked, uh, I worked in either construction, I slung ice cream at Maggie Moo's, uh, through college. I bounced at club Electra, uh, and to pay for fraternity dues. So I was always like scrapping and hustling, um, just because like I needed the money and I, and I needed to make money. I didn't, I didn't have allowance. So I think that was kind of how we were always built and I was built. And then, um, when it came to like deciding to leave uh, you know, a corporate job where I built really good corporate hygiene at Jones Lang LaSalle, it was, um, you know, I, I gotta give Tonelli credit. He, he, you know, his background's incredible, but he was really pushing me like, let's go build something. Let's go do it. This is how you build wealth. Um, and let's take risk. We're young, we have no obligations, we don't have mortgages, we don't have kids. Um, and so when I remember leaving my job, I sat down with, you know, Bill Magner and Jeff Lynn was my boss. And I was like, Hey, I'm going to go build gyms. I already have one started and I'm going to go build like eight more and then see where it takes me. Uh-huh. And Jeff being like, how much money do you have in your bank account? I told him, he was like, oh man, he's like, uh, let me keep you on health insurance for another six months. Uh, we'll figure something out. Uh, are you sure you want to do this? And I was like, yeah, I want, I, you know, Jeff, what's the worst case scenario? Like, you know, I can come back work for you. And he was like, I'm going to backfill you. So no. And I was like, well, then I can go shell, sell shoes at Nordstrom's. And that, and he was like, yeah, Nordstrom's would probably hire you to sell shoes in the men's department. Um, and I was always like, yeah. So that was always, because I remember reading Good to Great and they talk about Nordstrom's and they bring people on who are like entrepreneurial and then you sell shoes, you work your way up. And so that was like my safety net in my head that I always got okay with at the early stage. What? <laughs> Assumption you would get hired, right? It's like yeah, with the assumption that like worst case scenario, these gyms fail. I put my own money into it; doesn't work. I have nothing. I can go sell shoes at Nordstrom. That's like always what I thought, and I would tell them that was part of like my mantra that that got me okay with the risk taking. And then one thing led to another, and like you, you have a couple wins, you have a couple setbacks, but you keep building on the wins. You also learn like human beings are very adaptable, right? And so you learn to live a very scrappy life. You know, Tanelli and I had a, a, another roommate in like a one bedroom apartment that we built into like a three bedroom loft in New York City, you know, uh, where we would Airbnb out my room on weekends because I would take the Chinatown bus and go work at a club and a, and a bar that my friends owned in Washington, D.C. And then we would split the Airbnb revenue with other two roommates. And we were just trying to make it work. Right. And, and everyone has those stories who were building things early on. And um, I don't want to sit here and act like I've made it, but those lessons I go back to and I tell people that and they're like, damn, that is sacrifice. Um, and so that was like, kind of like my business school. That was my, I got my MBA on the street, right? <laughs> That's what I always tell people. Uh, and then you kind of have some wins and, and, and you know, we built a lending business together and, and um, you know, we got lucky. And as we were raising our series A, you know, a company came in and, and acquired us called Funding Circle. And, um, you know, I spent four years there leading uh, the U.S. revenue business and I built a lot of my management chops there and, and, and got like, you know, good feedback of how to get better as, as, a, as an executive and um, how to be very intentional with how I present myself and you know, how to motivate a team and how to performance manage and um, how to report into a board. Uh, and then it got to a place where it was kind of like, you know, we had some, we had some good success. The company's getting ready to go public. Um, and I started thinking about, okay, what's next? What is the next thing I want to do? And I wanted to take the biggest swing I possibly could because I wasn't married, even though I'm getting married now. I wasn't married at the time. I didn't have a mortgage. And I was like, I think I got one really risky swing left in me. Um, built a bunch of things. Some went well, some didn't. Uh, this last thing went pretty well, but still had, I want to take a massive, what's the biggest swing I can take? So I looked around and then like, it was kind of staring right, staring right at me. It was like my brother was in this dying league that treated him and all the other athletes poorly, but it was around and hung in there for 19 years. So I viewed it as a distressed asset. Let's go buy it. They didn't take us seriously, like I said at the top. And so then I was like, you know, screw it. Let's just go start our own sports league. 
Um, and so, you know, that th will probably be the riskiest thing I've, I'll ever do, but because it was really not only the risk, but the stress. <laughs> So that, that's kind of like my mentality. That was a long-winded way to answer your question. That's brilliant. I absolutely love it. I absolutely love it. And again, that's the thing is like, you, you got to take risk and we've all done that. We've all spent sometimes years on couches and, you know, working construction a day at daytime and, and working the, the, the bouncing at a bar at night and still trying to do other things. And yeah, it's a, uh, I think we've all been there. And as we build the league right now, it's one of those things with our players. It's, it's a, we're, we're a small growth right now in terms of dollars and cents. We're not, we're not going to spend more than we have as we, as we grow it. And that's a really important thing. And so, you know, players are now able to get paid to play professional rugby in, in North America, which is fantastic, but it's not, it's not a cash cow yet. Right. And so, you know, when I was chasing that dream, literally I've got boots, I'll go anywhere in the world. Where do you need me? I'll, I'll work all summer at a bar and at a construction site to get the ticket to show up and to have a little money in my pocket to buy food and I'll sleep on a couch. Great. And we've all been that. We've all done that. And not to say that our, our players aren't making a lot of sacrifices to chase the dream and they are, uh, but it's, um, we, we, we've all been there. I think we can empathize is, is, is the whole point. And, you know, kind of thinking that how are you managing your team right now? What's your HR org structure look like? Like, what do you guys have? As, Cause you're a league, not just one, it's not one team, but you got the seven teams. How are you managing all that? Yeah, it's, it's, it's a good question. You know, we, you know, one of the first things that as we got our, our seat around of financing was like build out a, an org chart and what I wanted the, the, the organization to look like. And so I thought about, you know, oftentimes you go back to what you know best. And I was very fortunate to build, um, you know, and scale a, a lending, a financial technology company, a lending business in Silicon Valley from seed stage all the way to, to going public and, and also having, you know, reporting into the UK where, where the headquarters was. And so, you know, I, I was able to be parts of different growth stages and you know, experience getting layered and, and then, you know, moving up and, and just, I really experienced a lot of, of different movements in organization. And one of the things that stood out to me, like you called out was building a really good, strong, strong culture um, with uh, uh, the, the, the team's voice as part of it. Um, and then also having a strong uh, HR department. And so, you know, our, our last uh, hire before we had a hiring freeze um, was um, a new people operations associate uh, to tuck into our director of HR. Um, and, you know, just felt like we needed more, um, we needed more bandwidth in that part department, not only to service internally our, our company and the people that work for the league, but also to help out with our players and the benefits as we give them health healthcare, uh, our coaches, some of them are on healthcare. You know, all of our players uh, and coaches now have stock options in the league to really manage that process better. Because originally it was me, myself, myself, and 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 uh, our COO and our head of HR. And I was like, we just need more more bandwidth there. Uh, we've developed a, a, a culture committee as well, where we're um, more internally focused on on culture and the initiatives and getting feedback uh, in a safe and anonymous way from employees and colleagues around what can we be doing better to foster a culture. And that and it was funny because she joined us. Her name is Sam, Sam Cook. She joined us uh, two days before we went on full lockdown. <laughs> so her job changed uh, pretty quickly, um, but it's been, uh, she's done a great job. She works so hard and um, I'm proud of the new initiatives she's been able to implement during this time. And um, how quickly she's been able to you know, get acclimated and what we've been able to do, not only for the league, but also for our players and providing new updates around our new insurance programs and, and stock options and how we're going to pivot in this new league. So it's, it's been, um, it's been a wild ride, but that's something we focus on a lot. And, and that's, that's the thing, right. Is, 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 is getting, you know, it's how do you manage all that? And that's always the hardest part because you could be focusing on this aspect of things, taking, taking a deep dive because it's under resourced and then something else is popping up over here. Right. And it's yep. really hard to kind of get that balance and, and, and figuring out the right people to, to drive those. Right. People ask me all the time, okay, what's, what's a typical day. And I think it's going to be this, but half the time it's firefighting over here because systemically we haven't built it to where it needs to be. And even when you build it, it's constantly iterating and you know, you're half firefighter, half trying to have trying to manage that. You mentioned culture is really, really important. And people talk about culture all the time. The, the culture is there, right? It, it's whatever the behaviors are every day. But I think from my outside looking in, what you guys have done a good job is establishing, okay, this is who we are day one. This is, these are the behavior norms we're going to have. This is how we're going to drive this forward. And, and, you know, going back to the value system that you had discussed, I think that's a really important piece is just that, 
that constantness of driving because culture is going to be there and all that is is a is, is everybody's collective behaviors right mm -hmm. and i mean that that skeleton to, to keep going back to which is great as you continue to build this thing so pll right you've, you've you guys have been building for four years you've had two seasons you know what's something you look back and be like okay that was a massive failure um lesson learned yeah, that's a good question. Uh, I don't, I don't really get asked that, which, which I should more. I try to ask myself that probably um, more than, just like my own consciousness, but I don't, no one really asks that. It's a great question. Everybody's like, fail fast, fail fast, and life will be great. Fail fast. And it's like, do I really want to fail? Is that what I'm really, I don't wake up in the morning and be like, I'm going to fail really fast today. Right, exactly. Um, and, and there's like, and I think our society uh, only really celebrates the winners, but the reality is the majority of people uh, don't have success or, or, or they have like a failure and they call it a failure, but it's really a learning opportunity. Um, and, and, and also like venture capitalists know when, when they're investing that, you know, nine of their 10 investments, if they make an uh, annual basis, aren't going to win and one does, right? And so they know there's a ton of risk built into it, but we only talk and celebrate the winners. We don't talk about what we can learn from the failures. So it's a really good question. Um, I think some of the things, some of the things that I've learned are um, uh, trust your gut on things, um, especially now in my career. I'm 36, but I, I was fortunate to go out and start building different businesses when I was 26. I left my job, so or 25. So it's been 10, 11 years um, that I've just been out on my own, and so I've seen some things. I've been through some some wars. I have some battle scars. And sometimes I don't trust my own intuition. And I think that's something that um, is actually a really interesting database from a psychological perspective, because all your experience actually registers in your brain. Um, and it's like a, it's an amazing algorithm that we have as humans to be able to draw back on those experiences instantaneously and be like, what happened in that situation when this happened to me three years ago? And you can revert back to it, recall it, like, this is what I did then. That was a mistake. Let me try this thing differently. Um, and so I think there's been a lot of experiences where, you know, I had that recall happen. I, you know, the algorithm flipped on in my brain and I didn't trust it. And I made the wrong call because I was either overly analytical or wanted to get everyone's opinion. Um, you know, acutely, I think that one of my mistakes was we, last year, we outsourced ticket sales. Um, and look, there's great agencies out there who I'm sure could have crushed it for us. But I didn't trust, and I built a sales organization, a funding circle. <laughs> uh, it was a transactional organization. And so I was like, I don't know ticket sales. Everyone says this is like, you know, the, the, the sort of ground and pound, hardest part of sports. And I was like, you know what? I, I have so many other things I need to focus on. I'm going to hire an agency. They're just going to take care of this. Everything else we're going to do in-house. In we're going to do sponsorships in-house. We're going to do operations in-house. We're going to do, you know, HR, finance every media, uh, social, everything's going to be in the house, but I, where a big chunk of our revenue was associated, I was willing to outsource it. Um, and I was just, I was, I was, um, I didn't trust my gut that we could have figured it out. Um, and so we outsourced it and, um, uh, I don't think we paid enough attention to it, even though we, we tried and that was a mistake. And that was something that everyone liked to poke at us last year. Well, these games and these fans, uh, there, there was a ton of empty stadium, uh, empty seats. And then, we had a couple, we had a couple games where we sold out, but um, that was a mistake. And then we brought everyone in house over the fall uh, and tickets started flying off the shelf. We had like an amazing ticket sales team. Uh, and I was so excited about really getting behind that team and we were getting behind them. And um, you know, our VP of sales, Mick Davis, Dartmouth football guy built uh, an incredible team and then ended up uh, having to pull sort of the, the, the emergency break there because of COVID but it doesn't mean we can't get back there is what I tell them. It's like, we've done it once. We got through, you know, the first early couple stages and now we can get back there when we can turn tickets back on. But that was like an acute example of me not trusting myself, outsourcing it, it being a mistake and then bringing it in house. And everybody says that, you know, just get rid of your liabilities and let somebody else, but let another professional take care of that. You know, you reduce your, your cost liabilities, bring it in house, you're increasing those cost liabilities, but you have more control, which is great. And that's we've kept it in house and we've had a lot of failures in that as well. Right. We've kept it in house. And, you know, sometimes you, you know, you're penny wise pound foolish in that regard where it is a lot of ticket sales, a lot of blocking and tackling and, 
Um, and you can't do that if, if you can't get the brand right and you're not connecting. And that's probably for, for me, the biggest, like looking back, you know, we're like, oh, it's rugby and people just don't know it yet. And we'll let them know about it. As soon as they know it, they're just going to come flooding. And the reality is like, no, you know, how many passionate people there may be about the sport globally and even in certain areas and in our area, it's not that simple. You don't just, the faucet just doesn't turn on because you have a bathtub. It just doesn't work that way. Right. You have to build a whole system behind it and everything else. And so, I think for us and for me in particular, it's like, oh yeah, yeah, rugby's gonna sell. And you know, I was coming in from the side and this is so great and we're in the Olympics and life is good and it's for boys and girls and it's so diverse and everybody can play and there's a position for everybody and the values are so great and people just are gonna know that as soon as we as soon as we build the bathtub. And it's just it doesn't work that way, right? And so for us, like of those pieces, okay, what do people actually want to do and be a part of? Right. And for us, that's really been a very healthy experience now to be going through and be like, okay, let's make sure that that is part of our conversation with our future fans is no, no, you don't have to buy into the sport of rugby. We think you're going to love it. You know, once you come a part of it and you know, kids may start playing, but if not, you're still going to love the experience of what rugby pro provides. And that's that celebration and um, just, you know, let's work hard, but let's, let's celebrate life. And so that's been a really big change for, for us and a mistake probably I over-resourced at the beginning. So yeah, I'm... interesting. Yeah, rugby is one of those things where you just want to get people there, yeah. right? Just come to the game, experience and see these amazing athletes, see the culture before, after, the camaraderie, how it's like they're able from whistle to whistle to be en enemies, and then, and then after the games are done, they're best friends, and, and that's, that's unlike anything else. And so just getting them in the seat, right, is such a big piece of it. Um, and yeah, I think there's a lot of different ways that we would probably bore everyone that's listening to this on how to do that. But it's a real strategy at the beginning of getting new fans. It's like, just come experience this and trust me, this is why I'm hooked. There's a good chance you might be hooked too, but you're also competing with lots of other things, right? So it's difficult. You got to make that value proposition like you're talking about. I'm not just competing with other sports. It's what is your family going to do for three hours this Saturday? You know, what are you going to do with your buddies for a couple of hours this weekend? And that's the, the, real, the real key thing. I think what you guys have done a good job in that regard is, because people who know lacrosse are like, okay, I'm either a lacrosse person or I'm not. My kids play or I don't. I played or I didn't, right? So they've already made that decision. What you guys have done is made it accessible again in terms of like, no, no, no. Like we're going to be a little bit different in terms of technology and we're a startup and, and we're trying to be savvy. So it's that narrative I think is, is the attractive piece, whether people are attracted to lacrosse yet or not. Um, right. And I love lacrosse because my buddies played in college and where I grew up in Utah didn't exist at the time. Um, and that's, that was my relationship with lacrosse, but it was theirs. It was not something that I would probably go buy tickets for to go watch at the time. But yeah. that's the narrative that you guys have, have done a good job of starting to peel that back. So as you guys, like, how are you guys chasing new fans? Like, you know, how does that work? Yeah, it's, it's um, I think it's, it's, it's something we talk about a lot. It's something I talk about. It's like, how do we get net new fans to the sport? Because that's the only way we're really going to grow this thing. You know, we, we have a great base. Um, and even peeling it back, you know, there's, it's the oldest indigenous sport in North America, um, started by the Native Americans, and we uh, we are we are doing our best to honor that, talk about that more. We have a lot of plans to celebrate that and spell, celebrate those communities, um, and celebrate you know why they created the sport, giving people more history lesson there. Um, there's a reason why it's been carrying over um, uh, till today because it is such a, a, a fast paced um, team based sport that also has you know cont uh, contact. Um, but also like a lot of uh, skill involved as well. And so we, we literally look at it as this cool marriage of a bunch of different other sports. Um, uh, like, you know, you have the, this, yeah, I love it. exactly. You have a skill set of hockey, but you have some of the contact of football you have the team corrupt camaraderie of, of uh, and spacing of soccer. And so it's just, it's just really a, it's really a cool thing for us um, on just getting new fans. It's, it's really sort of a, a ground up effort, a sort of bottom up effort. And, you know, you got to take a multi-prong approach to it. So it's, it's a lot of it's storytelling around our athletes um, because all it takes is someone to get hooked on this person's story, this athlete's story and why they're so unique, why they're so different than maybe what they thought about a lacrosse player. Um, you know, we have 60% of our players went to public high schools. They're not, the majority of our players aren't from our private schools. Um, which nothing against private schools, uh, but they, they, they went to public public high school and they came from middle class backgrounds, right? Um, and so lacrosse is definitely being played at a, uh, at a more sort of broader 
uh, demographic level than, than I think people give it credit for. And so a lot of st that storytelling is saying, hey, this is this can be you too, right? Um, and explaining that and getting that those stories out to people. Um, a lot of it's in the broadcast, so on television as well. The biggest thing for me is like, you know, coming from coming from tech, I wasn't spending my time in sports and media. And so I wasn't hooked at, you know, living in San Francisco, I was hiking on weekends, I wasn't watching sports. Um, and so I needed to get back into it. And I thought about myself as a case study of, you know, what's it going to take to get the other Mike Rables out there into this sport? And I thought about, you know, I used to love sports because I played college football and I was obsessed with it. I remember one time during two days, my senior year saying I would play football for Dartmouth the rest of my life if I could. And so how do I get that feeling back? Because I was playing. And so it was like, how do we make the broadcast more immersive? And so a big thing for us, we were the first sports league to ever do it is in the games, mic up players, interview them while it's happening. Scored. Yeah. Yep. You can hear the celebrations. I wanted people to feel like they're on the field. I wanted people to feel like they were there so uh, they could get hooked and be like, man, this, not only is this game fast, but like, I feel like I'm playing sports again. And I don't get that at the other sports. I get that with lacrosse. So those are just a couple examples of just getting those fans who aren't hooked on the game, but just to get more attached to our players to understand, uh, you know, that, that we're a more diverse sport and they give us credit for and then through the broadcast, really bringing to life what it feels like to be an athlete again, or even if you're never an athlete, why sport is so great. Yeah, that's brilliant. I love it. You guys have had some big announcements lately. Um, you know, betting, obviously, coming in to uh, the – you guys, it's a championship you're calling it, right? Championship series, yep. How does that work? Like, how do people access that? Like, what does that look like? How hard was that to set up? I mean, you got to have some pretty sweet data. Yeah, it's pretty nuanced, uh, to be honest with you. And we resourced it uh, quite a bit because we knew, uh, and it's a good call out, and I didn't even mention that, but it's a good call out around how do we get net new sports fans um, and, and drive viewership up. Uh, and a big part of that is is, is um, legal betting and, and, and gaming. And so we needed to figure out a way to, to pull up people uh, who traditionally watch sports just for the betting and, and legal legalized gambling aspect to then sort of watch and pay attention to lacrosse because that'll ultimately drive engagement and viewership. And so it was a, it was a pretty well-resourced effort where you know, our head of strategy spent, I'd say 80% of his time focused on getting this set up and then building our, our database in-house. Our head of product came over and uh, he spent, moved him out from Philadelphia. He spent a ton of time on, okay, we need to get our, our statistics team, uh, all of our stats from last year, a little bit more robust, a little more organized, uh, more aesthetically pleasing, but then have, uh, build an API on top of that database and it can be called up through an integrity partner. So then we, we launched with Genius Sports a couple months ago who you have to have an integrity partner who manages the integrity of the league uh, and then also pulls all your data and then provides it to the third party AGOs who are then posting the, the lines. And so, you know, we have, we have an announcement coming up with, um, you know, one of the, one of the AGOs who's, who's, who's going to be carrying our lines um, and doing a lot of promotion through that. We're gonna be pushing pushing through that and they're gonna be doing some in-game features. And we're gonna figure out this year if we can do live in-game betting or not. So calling out new bets and, and props during the game, or if we need to wait till next year because it's all happening so fast. Um, but the net net of it is, is there's multiple layers and that first piece is getting your in-house stats organized, building a technology on that. So an integrity group can pull it and then provide it to the AGOs. And then you gotta get an AGO who buys into it and believes that there's gonna be enough people betting on the lines yep take the risk and then have have the volume to make it work it's about volume. exactly yeah which is cool and then you guys just announced there's a network you are taking over or merging with or yeah you? yeah we just did our first acquisition uh which was exciting i spent a lot of my time on that um uh it was it's called the the lacrosse network tln uh, so it's it sort of an mcm that was built i want to say nine years ago the, the, the goal was just just to show more lacrosse in a digital way uh, and cover lacrosse, the youth level, high school, collegiate, pro, men's and women's. Um, and then it was acquired by a larger MCM called Whistle Sports. Um, they, they held on to it for a while, you know, started getting more traction on some other things in their production business. Um, and so the resources, they, they, they shifted resources away from this lacrosse vertical to other, other production capabilities that were, that were driving larger margins for them. So we looked at it um, and thought it could be a nice way for us to um, cover more of lacrosse outside of just the PLL, not as trying to build a media company, but really just 
bring to life the game and how many different people are playing on the men's and women's side and set more of a network up where we can, um, you know, drive more eyeballs to the sport. Um, it also allows for sponsors to come on who you maybe want to spend with the PLL, but want to spend in, in women's sports. And we say, okay, we can go build this feature on these, you know, high school athletes in this part of the country or this in place internationally where we can do a feature, we can produce it, shoot it and do a branded content campaign there. And then the PLL is able to, you know, retain the proceeds of that. So it really opens up, builds a larger market opportunity for us in addition to what we're already doing at the PLL. So it's, you know, it begs the question, if, if you're not, if the strategy there is not to be a media company, right? It, is it like, are you going to burn it hot in lacrosse and then lacrosse will grow? Or are you going to take these skill sets and apply them across other verticals? I mean, where, what are you looking in that regard? I think, you know, we actually think of ourselves as, as a media business that owns a sports league. Um, that's kind of what we've always, always said. Um, and, you know, media can mean a lot of different things. Uh, it can mean, you know, linear, you know, different forms of linear, digital, social. Um, and we try to kind of do it all. And then you have partnerships around, around, the, around the gamut. And so I think for us, we view it as just an extension. Um, and then also a way to get more creators involved, um, try out new talent, uh, there's, there's just so many things we can do with it. We're excited. We have a couple different ideas that we're going to be rolling out um, that are going to hope, hopefully allow us to, to sort of be more expansive at TLN. Uh, we look at case studies, um, you know, think, you know, bit, you know, different social verticals like um, uh, complex and what they've been able to do with their network and, you know, covering different industries uh, within uh, hip hop. And, and so they've been able to really expand and build different verticals and monetize them. And so, you know, building a sports league is, is takes time. Um, and so we wanted to be able to cover more of lacrosse with that and verticalize in, in a different way, sort of start spreading our wings and not sort of go long and deep in one area, not get distracted from our core fundamentals. But you know, we do we have built a, a large media team. And, you know, in the off season, there is some bandwidth. And so there, there's ability for us to also create and produce through those other channels that we've now acquired. Us already, so you might as well use that to leverage up other opportunities for, because it's, it's more sellable assets, right? Exactly. That's it. Which is brilliant. I love that. Uh, next frontier in sports, where, where are we heading? What do you think? Man, it's hard to say. I think um, AR, VR is really interesting. It's already happening. I think particularly on the VR side, but you know, with, with, with the pandemic, it's probably going to um, speed that up a little bit more, um, potentially, especially as like off season or programming windows are changing. Um, I could see a world where you know, there, there's a more just to collect full advertising dollars. Teams are getting smarter around VR stuff for consumers and then trying to bring in advertisers there. I think um, you know, gaming is, is a huge component of it, especially as um, uh, demog you know, a lot of advertisers are trying to get younger. I think that the new frontier, I, I always think about um, this, this quote when it's like, um, around, I think of his name was uh, Alvin Foster, as a writer. He, he said, um, uh, Alston Foster, he said, uh, it's more, it's to, when you're predicting the future, it's better to be imaginative uh, than, than right. And so to, to your question, right, I think about like advertising dollars are, um, are always trying to get younger because um, that's like the next generation. That's who's, who's going to be having more uh, spending power. And so I think about sort of what the NCAA has done with college athletes now being able to monetize their own personal image and likeness. I think you're going to see that dip into high school eventually too. There's just less of a governing body there. And you're starting to see, you know, high school athletes become, you know, huge assets for a college, right? It's almost like how big is their Instagram following might also drive up the rivals.com scoring. So I think that that is an area where you're going to see more advertising dollars dip even further down the chain. And you're going to have brands and media companies are going to have to get smarter on how they work with that talent, how they cover that, uh, what kind of resources they can provide that, that the talent doesn't have themselves. So I think it's just a really interesting and constantly evolving space that, you know, you have to be thinking about, okay, what can we do as a company to partner with the next generation of superstars and talent that aren't just with us now, but are going to be with us hopefully. And how do we help them make money? How do we help support them and provide resources to them? So I think that's an interesting space. Yeah, it's a really, really good point. And being an athlete, you know, when I was playing for the national team and you didn't have to have a social media following. It didn't exist, right? And like, it was an important piece of it. Just play your sport really well. And the complexity now 
of, of being an aspiring athlete and, and, and trying to play at the top level, it's not just what you can do on the field. It's what you bring to other parts of this ecosystem. It is it, it's a challenge. That's tough. And there's not a lot of education on that. And um, so a company like yours, it's forward thinking, be able to, to create an ecosystem that's, that's healthy and safe for them to grow that I think is really, really important piece. What about esports? You guys have a yeah, I think, I mean, obviously, esports are, are, are crushing, um, particularly now, right? Um, I think there's probably going to be some consolidation. To me, I don't pay enough attention to it because I'm not gaming out of time, but um, it seems to be uh, a bit fragmented. There's a lot of different leagues and teams, and it's hard to, to really pay attention to what's going on. I mean, obviously, I know the Overwatch League, but there's other leagues as well. And um, I think that it's going to, I think that my guess is there's going to be some consolidation in the space. Um, and you know, there's some leagues that are tour based or some leagues that are city based, but you can't deny the success. I mean, they're selling out arenas or they were, you know, pre COVID. Um, and now the engagement in those is going up in a meaningful way. We've lost sponsorship deals to big gaming platforms, um, just because there's, there's more eyeballs that are stickier there, uh, or at least the advertiser believes that. Um, so I think that there's no, there's no doubt that's a, that's a space that's interesting. Obviously you're seeing the NBA with their own league and you're seeing, you know, ownership groups go out and build their own teams um, and acquire, you know, portions and invest in the sport, the e-gaming sport, the e-sports space. So I think it's a new frontier. Um, I just, I, I still continue to believe that live, um, live sports with real athletes is still the most valuable content out there um, and will be forever. Um, it's, it's, it's time of memorial, something that people always gather to watch because you can't recreate that. And it's something that, you know, you're seeing the best in the world do. Um, and so I think that, you know, when you have um, ownership of that, I think that um, that's really valuable. And my guess is, you know, this is me being predictive, but uh, uh, just imaginative, I guess. I think that just as like the Netflixes and the Apples and the Quibis of the world are producing and, and, and pumping millions of dollars to own content, um, I think you might see a movement to some of these last large standing broadcast companies think about instead of renting, you know, the PLL's rights or the PGA's rights, the NFL's rights, um, they might take a look at why don't we just own these rights indefinitely? Okay. We can just buy, we can buy these rights forever. We can thin out the organization because we already have a sales team. We have better relationships. We have an option. We have a marketing team. But we own all these rights we'll have to rent them. We might not lose them because they pump a ton of brand value into their partnerships, right? If you look at NBC and our relationship, you know, we're side by side. Everyone relates PLL to NBC. And then, you know, I hope I'm partners with NBC for the next 20 years. But God forbid something happen and, you know, we go over to somewhere else and, um, you know, they lose, they lose that invested equity that they put alongside the PLL. Another network picks it up. Like, remember, you look at old clips of like, NBA on NBC and they, and they had that great music and you're like, man, what happened there? Uh, NBC lost all that value and they put all this, these resources to build that up with their talent and then ESPN and Turner take it. So I think there's a world where that could happen too, where you're starting to see you know, broadcast companies start to take more ownership or do longer term deals or even think about acquiring sports rights. I love that. Praj is on, who's on in the background. Praj is part of our MLR was one of the first to go virtual in terms of doing like a, you know, rugby virtual as soon as COVID hit. Like we, our impressions were crazy. They were fantastic, uh, which was great to see. But, you know, we would have never done that had it not been for, for the crisis and uh, just opportunity for our partners to, to get some exposure. And they got really good exposure, which was great to see. But awesome. again, where, where were we before that? Like, well, wasn't that part of our everyday thought process? And, you know, that was a tough one. A couple of rapid fire questions for you. Uh, one wish, what would it be? Um, world peace at this point, for sure. I think that's probably something everyone always says, but at this point, it, it feels like we need peace. Going through right now, and just an education. You know, it's just that we we have failed to educate ourselves appropriately about the atrocities of our own country for a long, long time. I mean, basically, at concentration camps, we did have concentration camps in, in the United States for a long, long time, but instead of killing all of them off, we just would trade them you know and that's what our ancestors did and that's that's awful our country's ancestors it's it's horrific and you know there's a lot of there's a lot of wounds there and systemic issues we got to fix um, and getting towards peace would be would be a wonderful beautiful thing and, absolutely um best book favorite book 
Oh man, so many. Um, I'll, I'll give you a, a book I'm reading right now, just because it's been very uh, helpful during this time. Because I don't have a lot. Of, I think a lot of people that uh, don't have much time with just sort of the change in, in the world. Um, it's it's a little cliche, but uh, Tim Ferriss's book Tools of Titans. I like the way he structured it because he does all these podcasts, and there's all these really cool nuggets of information that all of his interviewers do. But you find yourself don't you don't have 90 minutes, two hours to listen to these podcasts. So he's highlighted all these nuggets from all these great people he's had in this podcast and put into one book. And you can, you can skip through the book and be like, okay, I want to, I want to learn about health right now. I want to learn about wellness. I want to learn about being a great executive coach or human psychology or neuroscience or a great executive. And you can whip through the book and read whatever you want. And so at night I've just been reading and then here's like six to 10 different nuggets uh, of wisdom from each leader. And so I've been reading a couple per night and it's been really valuable to me. Okay. And, you know, you brought up Good to Great earlier and all, all the stuff that, that, that Jim Collins did was fantastic. You know, obviously the old Bill Walsh stuff was was really, really pertinent to, to my life early on. You know, the score will take care of itself, process-based. Love, love that. All, all, that was fantastic. Um, any good movies lately? Oh, man. Uh, good movies. So I, I don't have a good movie I've watched, but I watched, um, there's a really cool document, docu-series on Netflix right now called Lennox Hill. Okay. Uh, it was filmed in like 2018, but it's essentially this hospital in, I think it's Greenwich Village in New York that started with the neuroscience department and then built into, you know, the, the full, full blown hospital with, with several departments. And um, they highlight the two chairs, the chair and vice chair of neurosurgery, neurosurgery department. And then they have the, uh, you know, the head of OBGYN and then they have the uh, head nurse of the ER, or sorry, the head doctor in the ER department. And they just follow these these people in this New York in this New York hospital and just seeing how much and it's like apropos to what's going on right now. And then they did like one segment at the end and they went back to the hospital during COVID at the beginning of it. Um, but just seeing sort of the um, altruistic nature of what these 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 doctors do and these nurses um, and, and how they live live just sort of a selfless life. Um, even though I know that they're, they're, they're making good money, it's, it's still like for the stress that they're taking, um, it, it put sort of my life in perspective a bit um, and just what you know, the stress I'm going under and to see a neurosurgeon pull out, you know, uh, a tumor out of someone's brain and, and, and then have hard conversations with families that they didn't, he wasn't able to get it all and to see the patience of a nurse uh, and doctor in ER uh, when someone comes in off the street and maybe they're on drugs, maybe they're just hungry I was just like, man, this was one of the best series I've seen in a long time. Great. So not a movie, Breck, but a, a docu-series, Breck. I love it. My, my wife's an MD, well, she's a second-year resident. So she'd been in biotech for a long time. We came back to do her training, and you know, she's in the middle of intern year when COVID hits and wow. the system's in place, and they've worked really, really hard. Like she's on call, so I'm going to race in a few minutes after getting a few sure. more. Well, in, this, in the time you don't have, make sure you guys watch Lennox Hill together. Exactly, exactly. exactly. Yeah, brilliant. Um, in the PLL, uh, who's a player who can uh, beat a Grizzly with no weapons? Uh, man. I'm going to uh, – uh, It's hard for me to pick players because they're all so great. I, I guess I'll, I'll go with my brother. He's tenacious. I've never seen he, – his, his work ethic and stamina just in life is unlike anything I've ever seen. Awesome. Stamina is so important, being able to do that. Sets, sets people apart for sure, doesn't it? What's your favorite uh, Free Jacks merch? Oh man, yeah, I gotta get some merch. Uh, I, I mean, I think I, I, I gotta get some, you know, tell me, tell me what's your, what's your best selling item, then I'm gonna buy some. Lion is amazing. Our old school cotton jersey is amazing. There's, there's so many good ones. Shoot me uh, your address when we're done and what, just let me know your sizes. We'll, we'll... I, I, I'm gonna buy it. I gotta support, I gotta support. I will not accept free merch. I'm gonna buy it. We gotta support each other. Great um, bungee smugglers, like they're amazing. You might love it's like Speedo. <laughs> hey, I need, I'm in the market for a Speedo. I'm going to get back into swimming. So there we go. It'll be brilliant. It'll be so good. It'll be so good. Okay, what can we expect? PLL, July 25th. Yeah, July 25th, PLL Championship Series starts on NBC. Uh, we're going to have the first uh, eight games are going to be on television between NBC. So the first game and the second game are going to be in NBC and NBCSN, and then NBC for the third game. Um, so a ton of TV coverage. Um, and I think that a really cool thing for people to do is, um, I know March Madness didn't happen this year. So we have a free to play bracket challenge on our website where people, you can get a, 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 a bracket and fill it out with your office or your friends. 
a way to engage and watch the PLL games, place a little wager if you want. If not, you know, a pack of donuts to get to the winner at the end. Um, and it's a way to engage with the games and, 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 and you know, your colleagues or people that you've maybe been um, isolated from. That package of donuts is a sellable asset. So that's yeah, exactly. Exactly. I need, we need a donut sponsor at the PLL. We love Everybody donuts on here. Come on, man. Everybody needs a donut sponsor. Everybody. Look back at my biggest failure. I don't have a donut sponsor. Or I know. Exactly. Last one is, and I ask everybody this, if you run the Free Jacks day to day today, what would you be focusing on? Uh, I think, um, I, I think that just rugby players, like rugby, I, I've tried to play rugby once, uh, and I played a seven, a sevens tournament with, uh, with Tonelli, and right. it was one of the hardest things I ever had to do. Yeah. And it's a 400 meter sprint, you're doing 10 squat jumps, you're wrestling a bear, and then you're doing that again, like seven times in a row. Right. It's insane. And so I think, um, really getting, under the jersey with these players and understanding why they love rugby so much and just like really trying to find those, those, you know, call it five to 10 athletes that your guys are going long on and try to build their characters and get them, you know, more into sort of mainstream, mainstream culture, doing different collabs, but bringing those players to life and saying, you know, telling them, talking about their journey, talking about why they got into rugby, talking about, you know, they don't wear any pads and they're tackling each other full steam and they're getting, you know, cauliflower ear and they're just, they're just, and then they're hugging each other and drinking beers together afterwards. There's like so many cool stories you can tell there. Um, it's such an international game that I would just go really, really long on the digital content there. Yeah, with, with him, you know, it's, it's character, characters, conflict resolution. That's a tried and true story narrative, right? That's brilliant. Mike, it's so good to have you. Anything else you want to tell our audience before we jump off? No, I mean, I think the biggest will follow us on Instagram at PLL. And I okay. uh, appreciate you having me on, man. I'm looking forward to purchasing, purchasing some Free Jacks merch. Um, big fan of yours. And uh, go Big Green. I cannot wait until we get a hangout after a really successful championship here. And then COVID. Yeah. Thank you, man. Appreciate you having me on. Thank you. Awesome. See you guys.